Cool. Well, welcome everyone to the reproducible and immutable software track. This is the first year that we've done this at scale. Uh, a few of us got together last year, felt pretty strongly that this would be an interesting track to have, get some interesting folks to speak, and just uh, start to talk about some pretty important ways to build systems. So with that, we'll hear from Kyle Davis, and I think he's got some pretty cool things to say. So take it away. Hey, thanks. I don't know if it's that cool. We're talking about a pretty nerdy subject at 11.15 on a Saturday morning, right? Um, so this talk's going to be a little bit different. Uh, I am not going to tell you about some advancement in immutable software. I'm not going to tell you about something that I did. I'm not going to tell you about a war story from the trenches of using, using immutable software. What I'm going to talk about today is kind of a practical subject of how you even talk about this particular subject. Even we just say immutable software and people kind of glaze over, they don't really know what you're talking about. And there's good reasons for that, but I'm talking to the choir about that. What I really want to give you is some tools that you can use as you go about your day and you deal with people who have uh, questions about immutable software, how do you kind of frame it, where are people coming from on that. Um, so before we begin, I think this talk is kind of personal, so I need to tell you about who I am. Um, uh, I've been writing software my entire life. I'm Kyle Davis. I'm a developer advocate for the Bottle Rocket Project, which is an immutable container optimized operating system based on Linux used in the Kubernetes environment. I won't, this presentation is not about that. I am using the slide. That's our little logo here. It's ASCII art. Um, but uh, we'll bring it up a few times. But where this talk came from is not necessarily that related to Bottle Rocket. Now, I am not from Southern California. I'm actually from Northern Canada. So I live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And some people ask me, where the heck is that? It's the sixth largest city in Canada. It's a decent sized place. Uh, about 1.6 million people live there. Um, and if you geographically want to know where it is, if you know where Las Vegas is, most people know where Las Vegas is. If you go on the Las Vegas Strip and you start walking north for 18 days without <laughs> stopping, you will eventually end up in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, and it's not really a tech hub. You know, I work for AWS, I work remotely. I don't have a whole lot of colleagues in that area. Um, but one thing you should know about me is my partner, uh, she's a professor. She's a professor of uh, golden age Spanish literature. So if you think about Shakespeare, right? And then you think about Spain, so you have things like Cervantes and Lope de Vega and all this stuff. That has nothing to do with immutability, thankfully. Um, but one of the kind of side effects of that is I don't have a kind of uh, tech group that I run with, but I do often spend time with other academics. Um, and weirdly, what I do as a developer advocate is kind of similar to what academics do. I write papers, they write papers. I give presentations, they give presentations. So sometimes I'm in a social setting and I'll talk about what I do. And I went to talk to, uh, at a dinner party to one of my wife's colleagues and I said, well, you know what, right now I'm, I'm writing an article on immutability. And she gave me a very strange look. And she said, why are you talking about immutability? And I said, because the operating system that I work on is an immutable, uses, is it immutable from an operating system standpoint? Why would an operating system be immutable? And I said, well, there's lots of good reasons. Why are you asking me these questions? And she said, well, I have a PhD in philosophy and I talk about immutability in my classes when I teach it. Um, I can't square how this would have anything to do with what I talk about. We had a good conversation. Uh, th this was my wife's colleague named Dr. Susan Mills. Um, and I kind of struggled to actually describe immutability to somebody, right? This is something that I said, well, there's kind of like this and things don't change. And she said, well, I see where you're coming from on this but I still have a problem. I don't really get why anybody would care about this. So I had to really rethink about how I talk about immutability to people. Uh, I think as people in technology, we kind of go, yes, 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 it's immutable. That's good, right? Um, and we don't dwell too much on maybe why or what other people think about when they hear that term, right? And we encounter it in a lot of different ways. You'll see it in things like programming, you know, immutable variables. Um, various different languages talk about that. You'll see it in operating systems and infrastructure, and I think that's, this crowd will probably talk, resonate more with this, but we see it in other areas too. We see it in uh, you know, databases and ledgers, 
We see people talk about immutable databases and ledgers. And then we also have the philosophical concepts, right? So anybody that we're talking to may come back with the, this set of baggage depending on where they come from, right? And we might be trying to talk about immutability from an operating system standpoint or from an infrastructure standpoint, but they may have different ideas about it. So before we get any further, I just want to go over what I'm going to kind of cover in this talk. I'll talk about what it means in those different contexts that I talk about on the previous slide. I'll talk about what problems it solves and why people should care about it, where people get confused because immutability can be a really confusing term because it does have a lot of different uh, meanings in different contexts. I'll give you some takeaways and some things that you can use when you go and talk to your friends and family or colleagues about immutability, because I know you all are going to do that, right? Um, and then we'll end with a Q&A. So outside of computing, uh, this is where I didn't know anything six months ago about it. Um, it comes from philosophy. You'll see that a lot. And I decided to go, I'm going to talk to the source, talk to somebody who knows a lot about immutability, somebody who teaches this every, every week to students. So I talked to Susan Mills. Uh, and I said, you know, I really want to understand that. I don't have a background in philosophy. Does anybody have a background in philosophy before I say this? Raise your hand if you do. Thank God. Good. Because <laughs> um, I'm going to go way out of my depth here and talk about philosophy for a second. Uh, the first thing she said was, immutability means lacking the ability to change. Yeah. And I said, we could agree with that, right? I think when we talk about software, immutable software, lacking the ability to change is, is really interesting. And she said, well, it goes a little bit further than that. It really depends on when something is. And boy, is that an academic statement, right? Something is. When it comes into being, uh, it then lacks the ability to change from that point forward. OK, yeah, I think we can agree with that. You know, We create something uh, when it, it, it is, in different contexts, then that point forward, it lacks the ability to change. And then she said something that's interesting to me. I, I actually love this. It cannot endure change. Like, we don't use the word endure very often in computing, but I think it's really a useful concept. Um, and we'll get into this, especially as we talk about some of the other areas where we encounter the term immutability. But in the real life, we don't encounter anything that is immutable. The only two groups of people that really talk about immutability are philosophers and computer scientists, right? Like, that is a weird grouping to begin with. And the reason being is that when we're walking down a street or we walk anywhere on this earth, we don't ever encounter anything that is immutable from a philosophical standpoint. So if you think about the above definitions with lacking the ability to change, that means changing any properties of it, right? And so when we go and we look, we walk on the earth, we know the earth will erode, so that is changing. We know the earth will go away at some point, it will explode due to some cosmic event. Um, so everything we encounter is immutable, right? It will go through some process of change. The only thing that we really encounter in our day-to-day -day lives that is immutable is something like a natural law. So for example, a triangle, the sum of the angles is 180 degrees, right? That is immutable. If we were to change that property of something, it would no longer be a triangle. Vis-a-vis, -vis, it is an immutable law. Now, the other thing that you get into philosophy, and indeed, if you Google uh, anything about immutability in philosophy, you're going to run into things that go deeply into religion, right? Um, specifically, deities, so gods or whatever you want to say, uh, all-powerful beings and immutability. And I talked to her a little bit about that. Um, where you get into this kind of weird um, kind of property here is that if something is all-powerful, that means that it is outside of time. Um, but if it's inside of time, it's subject to change, right? Like, that's kind of, you know, blow your brain out a little bit thinking about that. Um, and the other thing that you can think about, too, is if something is all-powerful, it cannot change because it isn't lacking, right? This kind of gets into these weird areas. Now, we don't, I think that we will see, um, you know, all of the things that we make are lacking, right? Like, hopefully, we are honest with ourselves that anything we make is lacking. So we, we can discard that part of it. But you'll, you'll see this. And this is where, if you start Googling around, you'll find lots. But there was an interesting thought experiment that does exist in philosophy. And I kind of like it um, because. It uses some terminology we use in an entirely different way, but it is useful to start thinking about how we evaluate if something is immutable. If we have an immutable container, 
Let's imagine that we have this container, and it, due to philosophical ideas about immutability, we could have it. It can exist in real life. We've established that. But the properties of an immutable container are interesting, or what we can do with that immutable container is interesting. So imagine a container you would use to like move your stuff when you're moving house. Um, so you take your container. It is immutable. You can put stuff into that container, and it can still be immutable. You can give it to somebody else, and it can still be immutable. Right? You haven't changed the property of the container itself. It's the outside of that container that you've changed. So what would make it not immutable? What could we do to that container? She said, ah, if the container had a lid, it would never be immutable. Um, so if you, have, you can close it, you've changed a property of it. And I actually kind of think that's a good litmus test, if we can think about that sort of thing. We'll get into like real containers later. But now we'll conclude the philosophical portion of this. We will call back to some of these a little bit later. So another place we encounter immutability is in programming. Um, Bottle Rocket has actually written, all of its user learning components are written in Rust, and the people associate Rust with immutability because of its variables. We'll get into that in a second. But you also encounter it in functional programming languages. Um, there's a lot of things to do with that. And indeed, functional programming languages often borrow from philosophy. I'm going to say the dreaded word of monad. Um, that comes from Leibniz back in the day, right? So uh, there is some interesting parts there. But why do we really care about immutability in programming languages? Well, there's a few reasons. Um, in modern computing, everything we're doing is running at an impossible speed that we could not comprehend as mere mortals, uh, and it's not doing things one at a time. If we were to go and look at a a 6502 NES, Nintendo Entertainment System, we can understand that it's running one opcode after another opcode after another opcode when it's processing, right? Uh, most of our processors don't really work that way these days, and we have a hard time as humans understanding what we're doing. So uh, when we start dealing with things that happen at different times, and it's off doing other processes. So I kind of looked around and looked at why people really care about this, and I kind of put four different things into a category. And that means stuff happening all at once. We're going to introduce lots of confounding factors when we have all of these things happening. We could have race conditions. We don't really know how to rationalize or think through some of these things. So if we make them immutable, it makes it easier for us to understand and us to create more solid software. And in a kind, slightly different context, we have this whole idea of complexity. We can write simpler software if we have it to be immutable, and we can debug that software in a way that we can understand and get deterministic results from it, and then we can write tests as well that would be really solid on that. It's hard to do that when you start realizing that things might mutate underneath you or go to any of those pieces. So there's a reason why we, we have adopted immutability in a, a number of different contexts, uh, especially with regard to programming. Now I want to show some source code here. This is a, a little snippet I stole from the the Rust book, this is one of the first examples they give you. Um, so if you didn't know anything about Rust and you just were kind of like given this piece of source code, you might say, okay, the value of x is 5 and the value of x is 6. Simple, dumb program, right? If you were to try to compile this, Rust is a compiled programming language, you'll say, yeah, no, you can't do that because you're trying to assign an immutable variable twice. So by default, all variables in Rust are immutable. So you say, okay, I get that. So I can't do that. I'd have to create a new variable some way or another, and go from there. Now, yesterday, one of the things that I get, gave was an open SCAD um, workshop. Has anybody used open SCAD? Raise your hand if you have. Yes. Um, so that also claims to have immutable variables. Let's take a look at the similar snippet, right? So again, if you didn't know anything about this, you would think it would say the value of x is 5 and the value of x is 6. This is straightforward. Uh, you're just inter interpolating the value into the string. Um, let's see what it output. Well, first off, we get a warning that we assigned it twice. It's overwritten. But the actual output of the program says the value of, is 6. Right? OK, so what's going on here? Uh, basically, uh, OpenSCAD has a different way of looking at how the variable scope works. It's basically last one wins, and the value only is or any variable only contains one value over its entire lifetime. So these are both two different ways of looking at immutability, but they could not be more different, right? So if you gave somebody a piece of Rust code and you said but th that they were familiar with OpenSCAD, they would have an entirely different way of looking at this and probably think it didn't work. And indeed, let's go back to Rust and take a look at it, right? 
uh, we made one change here. I added an extra let here. And indeed, if we went to compile this, we would get the standard value. Here we're doing shadowing. Um, so we've introduced like three different ways very quickly of looking at immutability, and you could get some really he some real head scratchers off of what people kind of think about immutability when they think about it when it comes in front of them. So already we're seeing that there, depending on your perspective of where you come from with immutability, you may have different ideas about it. Let's leave the world of programming and talk a little bit about databases and ledgers. So I think people's mental model about um, databases is something like a filing cabinet, right? You open the filing cabinet and there's folders in it that have a little tab on it that tells you what's in it. There's a document inside of that. Uh, you might have different ways of sorting those folders, that sort of thing. And so when you talk about immutability, something we've already established, maybe you know something from a programming language, you might go, why would you want a database to be immutable? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So it comes down to this idea that the data either has like a natural order component or it's an abstraction or structural representation of some sort of order as a primitive. You see this in things like Kafka or Redis streams, right? Uh, they both claim to be immutable. And they work kind of similarly. They're very different implementations of a similar idea. They're log-like structures. Um, and the other times you kind of see things as like time series databases where you have a timestamp. Usually you're recording a metric or something like that and that you constantly go through and add more things to it. And then we'll get into immutable ledgers in a second. That's an interesting one. So why would you want something like an ordered data structure to represent your data, right? Well, it comes down to this idea that mutating is really slow, right? When we want to go and mutate something, we're going to have to find where that is in memory or on disk, make a change there, potentially deallocate it, do a lot of these different things. But depending, if we think about, like, this is not how these work, but a, a simple, something like a linked list, we can always just add something to the end. That's an O1 operation. Um, but functionally, both Kafka and Redis are like these log-oriented structures. Um, but they don't always represent that on the surface to the users. Effectively, when you're adding items or you're modifying items or you're deleting items, you're just adding something to the end. So you're kind of taking this idea of what it is and you're appending it to the end. But it really seems odd, especially um, when you have that time component to it, that everything could be represented that way, but it, it works out. Um, but when you get into people having lots of head scratching when they talk about, well, if I make a bunch of changes to my data, won't it grow forever, right? I'm always amend, you're adding immutable pieces of data on top of something, won't it grow forever? And then you'll see the big brains in these projects go, aha, but we have separated out the data administration from the data um, reading and consuming and producing of that data, so we can go in an administrative function and do compaction and do uh, removals and do all these different pieces. Uh, so we are seeing this idea starting to split immutability into, yes, the individual data is immutable, but how we manage that data isn't immutable, right? So it's getting confusing. Now, I want to talk a little bit about ledgers. Um, a ledger is used to kind of to record the ownership of something, whether that be money or some item or whatever. And I think you might think immutability makes sense there, right? You want to make sure that things aren't changing from underneath you. Um, if you start looking up things about immutable ledgers, you'll start to see a few weasel words thrown in there about immutable. Nearly immutable, almost immutable, mostly immutable. Now, I am not a blockchain expert. I don't want to get into the uh, pros and cons of blockchain technologies and that sort of thing. Uh, I have my own opinions on it. I'm just kind of being descriptive this year, showing what people think about it or how they're talking about, about it. And I think that's interesting because I have a hard time taking those concepts, kind of the where these terms came from, from philosophy, and then rationalizing those with mostly, nearly, or almost. Um, come to find out, the way the immutable ledgers work on a general way is that they have some sort of cryptographic validation that will go in and validate the, the piece before it. And so it does have some properties of immutability, but um, especially in the blockchain, there's this thing called 51% uh, attack, and Bitcoin specifically. Um, where 51% of the participating nodes agree that history is different than it is. And I think that's a really interesting perspective uh, because it does fly into this fact that we talked about enduring change. Like, it can endure change. Um, so when we are talking about immutability, sometimes we have to actually go, go and go, okay, 
there's things in the family of immutability. If you come from this world, you might have some really kind of interesting ideas that may be something we have to dispel when we talk about it in other contexts. Um, so I want to go in and talk a little bit more about operating systems and infrastructure. Um, this is, I think, where this group probably encounters it more than programming or database uh, use. And, and it's interesting uh, for me, the project I work on is, is an immutable operating system. Um, but we see it all over. We see it in things like Nix. I see the people with Nix shirts on. There was NixCon earlier. Uh, Fedora Silverblue. Um, layers in Docker, I consider that part of infrastructure. They are considered immutable. Uh, Flatcar Linux, Bottle Rocket, uh, Talos Linux, Kairos. These are all, those four are all kind of similar uh, things that address things. They're container optimized uh, Linux distributions that are used to kind of provide a minimal base that you can run containers. Um, but they are all quite different in their own ways. But why do we see so much immutability when we talk about uh, immutable properties or things being marked as immutable when we're talking about operating systems? Well, it turns out uh, database, or excuse me, operating systems are kind of complicated. Uh, and this goes back a long ways. If we rewind the history quite a bit, we'll talk about the Unix philosophy uh, where we have not just one unitary thing that represents an entire operating system. Instead, it's a series of tools that are individually developed and versioned and collected, and then that makes us have distros. And when we have distros, we have to have package managers, and we're dealing with something pretty complicated at this point. Um, and a modern operating system in our today's environment is constantly dealing with things like vulnerabilities. Each of those po projects can have some sort of vulnerability. Uh, we need to make sure they're updated all the time, and it is far beyond any human to uh, actually go in and curate any of that and make sense of all the dependencies. Um, so we turn to the package manager. Um, and that introduces a new problem that is always interesting called drift. Now, is anybody familiar with the, the term drift in relation to this? A few people nods their heads. So okay, yeah. For those who don't know, uh, imagine that you are responsible for 1,000 servers. Um, in those 1,000 servers, you say, okay, it's time to update. We should be doing this constantly, but whatever. Just follow me for a second. Uh, you don't want to take your entire system offline, and you want to make sure that whatever you've done works for your new piece of software, that you're, or the, the underlying software works for your existing workload. Um, so you say, I'll divide it into four segments. I'll take 250 of my servers offline. I'll update those. And then the next day, I'll update the, each group of 250. That seems rational enough. So you go in and do that, and the next day you come into work, you say, I want to update the next 250. They go and reference a package manager, and the package manager says, let's get the most up-to-date piece of software for that. And guess what? Overnight, there's a bunch of packages that have changed. And you go to the third and the fourth group. And what you end up with is all this different stuff. And you turn on, you make sure your workloads work, and you go, wait a minute, half of the, my servers don't work. What's happened is every time you've updated your software, you've created a new variation, right? And every time you create a new variation, you create a potential for things not to work. And we call this drift. And uh, for people who are running a lot of software on a lot of servers, this can be a gigantic problem. And this all comes down to we're constantly going after this kind of uh, state where things are constantly changing. Now, you might say, okay, well, that's fine. I'll just go in and see where the problem is. Let me ask the different pieces of software what they are, what versions they're running. Seems easy enough. But can you be really be sure that your uh, machine isn't lying to you? Are you running what you think you're running? That is a hard problem to know. And you could think of things non-maliciously, and somebody could say, well, they released a version, and they did a small update to the binary. They didn't increment the version. It shouldn't happen that way, but it does. And you end up with something where it's okay, it's slightly different than it was. Okay, that happens, which it shouldn't, but it, it can. Um, then you go, well, there's other pop potentials here too. Maybe you should think about something malicious, right? A situation where you have some software that is changed by a bad actor, and that bad actor has changed something in a way that it reports the same version. And then you say, well, well that's fine, I'll, I'll just verify each piece, right? But how do you know you're verifying the thing that is true? So you start to doubt everything, and you go home and cry in your hands because nothing is real and life is not important anymore. Um, so you get into this kind of like tailspin of 
trying to see what you're doing. So that's something that adds a lot of doubt to anything. And maybe it doesn't even manifest this. It manifests as, works on my machine, right? We've all done that before. And you could say everything is the same version, um, but it could be lying to you. And we see things like Docker that have come in and uh, you know, containers are here to kind of ship the entire OS to somebody so that they can ensure that it works reliably. The only thing that you're sharing really is the kernel. But even then there's some problems because maybe there's a slightly different kernel version. So you get into this weird kind of constant loop of doubting yourself, doubting what you've deployed, uh, how can you be sure when you do it at scale, all things that can go wrong will, um, and you think there's gotta be a better way. I wanna shift gears a little bit more and talk about horticulture um, a little bit. We, there's a common phrase that we've heard, we've heard many years and I don't like it, uh, this cattle versus pets. And I, I, I'm uncomfortable with that on a number of reasons because I don't like to think about pets and cattle dying, it's just not great. But I like to think about beans versus bonsai trees. Um, so if you've been in any agricultural area of North America, the two common crops are corn and soybeans. And um, when a farmer goes into it, they don't give a crap about a single soybean plant, right? They think about, I am going to plant my field of soybeans. I'm going to water or irrigate the soybeans and I'm going to harvest the soybeans and I'm going to maybe fertilize at some point along that way. To them, it's one whole piece, right? And really, we have to think of our uh, systems that we're running at scale in the same way. We, we can't really talk about anything else. Unfortunately, what we do a lot of times when we don't deal with immutable software, we deal with bonsai trees. Now, bonsai trees are the nice little um, decorative trees that are sitting on somebody's table and they're beautiful. Every one of them is unique. The thing that else you don't know about bonsai trees is they start from a normal seed. It could be a pine tree, it could be an apple tree. It's just the way it's pruned very uh, specifically and cautiously to do that. But there's unfortunately no way that you can create a farm of bonsai trees, it just wouldn't work. Um, so when we're talking about this, really the beans are this immutable crop. Like we don't really care about the individual plant, we pull it up, we can replace it, it's fine. Um, but when we're not talking about, we're talking about mutable software, we're talking about bonsai trees, right? We've created potentially infinite tiny variations. So that leads me to my next point. Why do we care about immutability in general? This is one line I'd love you to take away. Immutability is ultimately just a complexity reduction stra strategy. That's all it is, right? Anything that you talk to anybody about, it boils down to, can you use concepts of immutability to make things less complex, right? Do you need less complexity in your world? If so, and if immutability is something that will help you here, this is a great way of going with it. Now, I think that all other things kind of branch off of this one single idea. The other thing that I want to talk about that branches off of this is atomicity. Database people love talking about atomicity. Um, with atomicity, you want to move from one state to another state without any weird states between, right? When we're talking about mutable software, we're always talking about things that have some sort of middle state, some sort of weird intermediary. Um, with immutability, what it enables us to do is make a clean, decisive cut. Um, true mutation happens all the time, and it's rarely atomic. Um, we talk about drift and how things are happening. That's, drift is a function of having a non-deterministic um, point of reference. And if you have something that you can make clean, decisive cuts instead of like this package by package update, um, you can reduce the complexity of making changes anywhere in your system by uh, having no middle ground. So really, atomicity is just one way of reducing the complexity uh, by making, immutability is one way that you can reduce the complexity uh, through atomicity. The other thing comes down to full resets. Um, the Nix OS people talk about like fearless updates, um, changes that you can always go back on. Um, Without immutability, this becomes nearly impossible. Um, it's hard to understand if something is really reversible unless it is fully immutable. So um, anything that we add in an immutable system can be boiled down to things like layers or composing different pieces together, um, but we're never altering anything. Remember, we go back to some of the concepts we're talking about, enduring change. 
Uh, we're not making any changes on those individual pieces. So the full reset is really a way that immutability, immutability reduces the complexity of making changes, ensuring that you can go back to a known good state. So this is a complexity that everybody worries about and it causes a lot of anxiety. And then scaling and automation. Um, you know, eight hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour means we have 480 minutes in a given work day, right? Um, if you deal with a thousand of anything, you could, you could tell your boss, I can't do that in a day if you want me to spend more than one minute on it and take no breaks, right? Um, we have to have ways that we can scale. Um, and if we start thinking about scaling uh, anything at any uh, breath, then we have to treat things in ways that have no individuality. We can't have bonsai trees, right? And the only way to achieve that is to have very straightforward automations that we're building that can work on immutable pieces of software. Um, it makes sense. You might be able to build automations that are you know, detecting something if it's this way or not that way and going through a lot of complexity about that, but that's really defeating the purpose. If we can just make something immutable, we can move from one state to another, we can identify it in a very specific way. And that brings me to cryptographic verification, or validation, I should say. Um, we talked a lot about your operating system lying to you, right? We can get down to the part that whatever is making that cryptographic hash, could it be lying to you? Of course it can. Um, but with immutable software, what we can do is something slightly different. We're um, looking at validating an entire um, piece. So in this case, um, if we don't have uh, immutable software, we're basically looking at trying to validate something against a moving target, and that will never work. So it becomes really useful to be able to validate software in this way. Bottle Rocket, as an example, uh, is, has a chain of trust that starts before the system boots with a root hash value that's stored in the non-volatile RAM, which is then verified by Shim, which Shim is then verifies uh, Grub, and then Grub verifies the bootloader or the, the first stage of the boot, and you go on each step until your software runs, uh, to your container start in Bottle Rocket specifically. That would be really difficult or impossible to pull off if we had a constantly moving state, right? So we've reduced the complexity and enable better validation by making all the software something that is easily uh, validated. Additionally, you can have things like uh, validation through um, block level devices like DM Verity, where you're actually looking at something and that's verifying every single block on your storage device um, and comparing it to our root hash. So if anytime anything changes, well, you can detect that and just stop the system. So with this, uh, you've really enabled cryptographic validation to come into its own and be extremely useful. You've reduced the complexity. So we've talked about how we've reduced complexity by adopting immutable software. So anytime you're talking to somebody, you can kind of come back to that line. But people get confused. Um, there's lots of ways people get confused. Now, um, I think the one thing that I get a lot when people ask me questions about Bottle Rocket and they say it's immutable OS, and they say, that's great, I love that. But really, how do I make changes to it, right? How, how can I do this? Because um, like, I can go into uh, the file system in Linux and just go, oh, that's a read-only file, oh, but I've got permission to change things. I can sudo a root or whatever. And I have to convince them, like, no, buddy, you, you can't do that, right? Like, it, it is literally immutable, and I talked about the verification before. It, it will, if you somehow change the block level device while the system is off, when it boots up, it will like not continue, it will never get to a, a working state. So I think we have to undo some of the ideas about what read-only means, because um, that's kind of poisoned the mind of your friends. So you might hear some people having those type of, um, you know, but what about, you know, how can I really change it? Um, the other thing that we kind of run into that's kind of the mind uh, virus here is this idea of constants. We see those in programming languages everywhere, and they're generally baked in at build time, and if you look in the binary themselves, you'll see them kind of like uh, every, um, you know, byte will be in there. And that's something that is a, you know, an interesting thing, and some operating, excuse me, programming languages do have immutable constants that are slightly different and others don't, so you can kind of have to feel where they're coming from on this, because it's not the same thing. We're talking about writing something 
once, and once it is, it exists, right? Um, so we kind of have to think about that. That's more of like a stone tablet being passed down. Something that I was surprised about, I went through and did like several hours of looking through what people were talking about, about different operating systems, looking at Silverblue, what people were saying, like, why should I adopt Silverblue in forum posts about Nix, things like that, and some stuff I know from working on Bottle Rocket. Um, and they'll say, but you can't ever upgrade it if it's immutable. How do I upgrade something? Um, and this is something, I, it's interesting to me. I, I think that, that there is, the people who bring this up think that you're somehow fundamentally changing the nature of the of the system itself and that you're doing some sort of one-way trip that you can never go back from. We're not fundamentally changing anything about the underlying hardware. We're not really fundamentally changing anything about that. So you have to kind of talk about upgrades when you're actually talking about the system, saying, well, upgrades is merely adding a new layer on top of something that you already have and then rebooting or changing the partition to boot to a different partition. There, there's always ways that you can do that, but you always kind of have to bring in that to the conversation. The other thing we see is this idea of like, oh gosh, I could never add a program. I could never uh, cache any files. I could never have a log file. And this is again somebody thinking, oh gosh, I, I have made something immutable. And they don't hear the operating system portion of it. They just think everything in the world is immutable, right? Um, and so you have to kind of tell them like, no, the world is actually not uh, that total. It's something where you can have one volume that is immutable and then one volume that is immutable. Um, and you can choose where things are appropriate for that. Now, I said earlier I've been, um, you know, writing software for as long as I can remember. Uh, I've been doing this my whole life, and indeed, it's before I can remember that I've been writing software, uh, kind of in a trivial way. There's a picture of myself sitting on my father's knee uh, in front of a Texas Instrument TI-99 4A. Is anybody familiar with that machine? A few people, okay. For those of you who aren't familiar, it's a home computer. Uh, it stopped being sold in 1984. It was actually a 16-bit computer, and it had 16K of RAM. Very unusual that we see the, num the amount of RAM and the number of bits in the processor match. Um, but um, what was interesting about that photo is there's a basic, I wish I could have it, it was at my dad's house. There's uh, a basic program in the background. You can see a basic listing. And I asked my dad, I said, what do you think that was? And he said, well, it's um, it was a little program that had uh, a, a sprite animation of a horse running across and Camptown races on the speaker. It's a cute picture, um, but I think it says something about immutability. The, the, what's interesting about that machine is it would boot into basic, right? You'd start in basic, and then you could type your program in. Uh, if you wanted to save anything, you would save it on an audio cassette that's set to the side. And in that picture, there's a little green cartridge in the machine. I can see it very clearly. And I still have that cartridge. The machine is long gone. It, it uh, uh, succumbed to a lightning strike, I believe. But um, the cartridge is fine, um, and it's the extended basic cartridge. And I talked to my dad about that, and he said, I said, well, why is the extended basic cartridge in it? He said, well, it's been a long time ago, but I can remember I ran the program on the basic that was on the machine, and it would work, um, but it wasn't very fast. And I had read that if I put extended basic, it would run a lot faster. So think about what happened. He wrote the program in basic on the operating system built on the system, stored it on an external device, and then he upgraded the system by changing and adding a cartridge in. Is that really fundamentally different than what we're talking about when we're talking about like updating an immutable operating system? Not really. We've seen this throughout computing. We'll see this uh, a little bit later as well. Um, you know, later on, we graduated to having two floppy drives. Um, one you'd put DOS on, uh, let's say DOS 3, uh, and then the next thing, your game would go in the next drive and you would run them. Uh, and back in the day, if you had a floppy drive, you'd put a sticker over one little notch and it would be uh, unwritable. You literally couldn't do anything. Um, and then if I wanted to update the operating system, I could just take that DOS 3 disk out, put DOS 5 in, and it could also be write protected as well. And yeah, maybe it's not an immutable operating system because the immutability is not coming from the operating system itself, coming from a hardware feature. But it's really pretty similar, right? Like these ideas are something that are not that unusual when you go back and look in history. But at some point we decided that we wanted to make everything in the world mutable, and maybe immutable software is something that we're kind of going back to true form of saying, this was a really bad idea to make things 
uh, everything to be changeable by anybody with the sufficient privileges, and the computer can lie to you, and this is all really a bad idea. Um, so I think it's not necessarily that weird of a concept. Now, I, I have a small activity. Um, please, if you can, if you have a phone on you, take your phone out and hold it up. Just kind of hold it up. Okay. Anybody running an operating system that is not Android or not iOS? Anybody? Wave your hand real high. Uh, everybody here has, oh, one person, thank you. What are you running? Yeah. <laughs> You're all running immutable operating systems in your pocket. Um, it, I think it's a really important point that this is not that unusual. Anything that basically does an over-the-air update is an immutable piece of software, so your friends and family are already running it. They just don't know it. Of course, the, none of these systems, could you imagine a phone that would have to go in and go to a package manager and update itself? It just seems like it would be a disaster. Everybody would be running in the streets on fire and screaming all the time because we're addicted to our phones. So it's not unusual. Um, we're just trying to apply it in a new and novel place when we're talking about immutable software, right? So this isn't something that you have to really get people to be used to. And I think that, and indeed, and like, you think about Android specifically, it uses the same exact verification method as, as Bottle Rocket does. Like, literally, it's the same technology. It uses DM Verity. Um, so in conclusion, um, immutability is subtly different across technologies. And anybody you talk to who is a technologist is going to have a different idea about what immutability means. But there is some core concepts that are all the same. You know, I, I think... Can it endure change is my, my favorite way I'm going to talk about immutability now. Um, but you might come from somebody who comes from OpenSCAD and has a very different idea that I can set something twice and the last one will always win. Um, but I think they will all get it because they've all kind of been through this idea of why this is a beneficial um, property. In essence, all that you're doing when you're making immutable software unless there is some sort of hardware reason for it, is you're reducing complexity. No one would be ever able to deal with their phone updating packages one at a time. That's too complex for the average user, so we instead create images that download one at a time and the phone reboots into the new operating system and everything is fine, and each individual uh, version of the phone has their own kind of nice sealed version of it. And so you can use the complexity reduction to be the like, you know, how are we going to do this? Well, that's how we're going to do it. You're going to have to deal with people who are confused. Um, we talked about the points of confusion early in this, and sometimes it's good to take that points of confusion and hit it off before you anticipate where they're coming from and then talk to them about the things that they will probably be confused by. Right? Talk about upgrades. Talk about how you're going to uh, have places to store your log files or your uh, applications. Get them before they start bringing these things up because we see this a lot. You will see common patterns of confusion. And finally, talk to them about this not being new, exotic, or weird in any way. It's something we all use every single day and that we're just trying to make their lives simple by not introducing the undue complexity that can lead to things like drifts and your software lying to you and being doubting everything in reality. So um, that's what I got. Hopefully, maybe we, this gives you some things to think about. Um, we'll go into Q&A. And I've got a question all the way in the back. Well, we got a, we got a mic runner. Uh, fantastic presentation, by the Thanks. way. A um, couple of thoughts, right? I didn't raise my hand on philosophy because I just dabble in it. And I could see why your, your, that uh, philosophy professor was confused because you know, when we do things in computer science, we use these abstractions because there mm -hmm. really is no immutability. Yeah. Right? right? So we all agree on that, right? Like that, I mean, there's always a, a latch. Yeah. And, all right. Um, but I thought the thing I, I kept thinking about in your presentation, which is the difference between hermetics mm. and, and immutability, right? Because it seems like, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, or have you thought about this? Because I love all, I worked at Docker, I, 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 yeah. I went through all that sort of immutable operating system stuff. But yeah. I, it seems to me that the uh, mutability is the what, and hermetics is the how. 
right? Yeah. So you think about the immutable container versus a hermetic container. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, you know, I, I've I read um, the hermetic container or the hermetic operating system blog post from the guy who did System D, which his name's escaping me, Leonard. Yeah, yeah, Leonard Potter. Um, and it's an interesting idea, and I, I think that I'm not probably the right person to answer that question, right? It's not something I have like said, okay, why are we not using this? I have some people on my team that are very enthusiastic about it, but I'm probably not the right, you know, how to answer the how on that. Uh, from my perspective, though, I talk to people all the time about immutability. I'm not sure we want to introduce another uh, concept that m might confuse them. I mean, we, we want to get them to the point where I'm going to make an assumption about this audience. Most people want to push the idea of immutability forward, right? Throwing another concept in, maybe that's going to uh, kind of move them away from complexity reduction. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, not a great answer, but that's what I can tell you. Hi. Yeah. Um, so maybe this is a nit about your talk. Sure, sure. Uh, it, it, it comes down, I think, where you're going to slice a word. So okay. my background was uh, programming, software engineering, mm -hmm. DevOps, and now it's security. Okay. And so immutability takes on a different context in each one of those areas. Right. But across all of them, I think, is a tenant, which is it's not to reduce complexity. Actually, immutability, to get immutability, you introduce a lot of complexity in the design and the implementations and the maintenance work. What you're really trying to do is create a more deterministic mm. environment in which to operate so you have less places to investigate when there's a problem. Yeah. And so <clears throat> the complexity increases, but your randomness decreases yeah. in the implementation. And I'll give an example of that, which is your patching. Mm -hmm. To patch one system is fairly easy. To patch a hundred systems gets a little bit more complex. But if you really go to scale and you're going to patch a thousand systems and you've got an SLA of 20 minutes, you know, to do it in, it gets really nutty. And so what do you have to do? You have to create your own code repositories and your own library repositories that you reference that you update at your frequency. Yeah. And the systems grab it when they're rebooting and you don't go to daily patching, you go to weekly patching or monthly patching or right. whatever the cycle is. But w what you're doing then is you, you do have drift, yep. but your drift, depending on how you're doing your blue, green, purple cycles, right? I, I live in three zones, <laughs> and so we have, you know, blue and green, and you mix blue and green, you get kind of a purplish color. Yeah. So, you know, we do this. That reduces the, the, the overall error rate. So yep. I, I think you're on the right track with immutability, but I think complexity is not the right word to use in that it's, it's, and that's just, it's where I slice the world yeah. based on my experience. No, I think that's, I, I like your comment on that. And determinism is, I think, determinism without immutability is possible, of course, but it, to me, you're shifting where you're making that management decision. Um, and like I understand where you're coming from on that. You're kind of curating your own um, drift, right? Um, and I think that, that when you start dealing with that, um, ultimately what would be nice to do is that you um, offload that responsibility that you were describing to someone else, right? Like if you can have a trusted supplier of all the packages that you would need and packaged into some sort of immutable container that you can evaluate, well then that's something you don't have to worry about, right? You just hit the button and it updates. Um, so I, I think there's, I really appreciate what you're talking about. And I think determinism, like, like I said, it's, it's, it feels like immutability without determinism isn't really useful, <laughs> right? 
Um, so I appreciate that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I get you. I get where you're coming from, and, and I, I think that's an interesting point um, with regards to like who's doing that complexity is, is always the question I have, right? Like a package manager is a complex, a complex thing. Anybody who has built a package manager uh, will know that it's pretty nutty to have to, to deal with. So somebody else has that complexity for you, right? When, when you deal about immutable software, though, you're actually kind of handling that more on your own, and it's for me, I can understand how. I can cryptographically verify an immutable piece of software, but I have a hard time, and I've worked with people who are on these projects that build package managers. Like, you get into dependency graphs and that sort of thing, and that's a huge, complex topic in and of itself. So I, I, I see where you're coming from on it. It's, it's, again, I think we're talking about, like, different parts of the process and different yeah, times. I, I think the talk is great. Uh, I'm just trying yeah. to, you know, discuss the fact that I went from a really simple design to something that was really complex that I had to teach people how to use in order to mm. gain the optim, you know, to yeah, optimize yeah. it at the end so that my deployment yeah. packages. And now in security, I really want immutability because when my auditor comes in and says, "How do you, you know, prove to me that nobody prove has screwed with your package yeah. while it's being deployed?" Well, I've got FIM. Well, that's not good enough. You know, what what languages are you implementing? Depending on, you know, like you know, if you're in a medical system, immutability is very important. But yeah, yeah. On your phone, is immutability really important? Well, probably not. I don't know. I have a lot of secrets on my phone. I don't think everybody else does, right? And you want your everybody to see that, but yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate the comment. We have a question up here. Thank you. Uh, do you have a sure. question up there? Yeah, so kind of to piggyback off of that, I'm also coming from a system side of things. And it seems like it's a little bit of an easier sell to developers and to desktop users. Yeah. Everything kind of lives off in the home directory, for example, yeah. versus a, a systems where if you have to patch a library, there's multiple dependencies. And, and yeah. uh, so I guess my question is, how do you sell it to, to system administrators where there's this understanding that uh, like you own the system, you own the environment, and then immutability seems to be taking those keys away from you. Yeah. Uh, and same thing too. How do you balance the pragmatism of? Because it seems like drifting is is more of a necessary evil in certain mm. environments. So the the the, the pragmatism versus uh, I don't I don't I don't know if it's the practicality of having a immutable environment uh, versus having all the keys to the kingdom yeah like how do you how do you balance that uh or how do you sell it yeah to a systems person well so one thing is i think most people uh understand that uh taking keys away is often uh really good right <laughs> like in another life i was responsible for an entire university's um housing system right i used to work in higher education and I hated having to carry around the campus master key. Like, this is a literal representation of, of that, right? Um, some of my colleagues loved and relished the power that, I, that, ha, that, I, that had, but I knew the responsibility of it, right? So when you're talking about selling this to other people, basically, and this is how we talk about it in Bottle Rocket, is like, okay, it's an AWS primary project, it's an open source operating system, but, um, you don't have to worry about that any longer. You get a package that you download, and your life is much simpler because you go, do I want to be on the current one? Yes, right? That's the decision you have to make instead of having to go through analysis paralysis on thousands and thousands of packages and understanding and analyzing them. But you know, and you can verify that, that that's the package you have. You can turn the machine off. You can verify the volume and understand where it is, right? So. In that case, it really is that idea of like, 
telling people to let go of this kind of like responsibility and defer it to somebody that maybe knows better. Inside a, another organization, though, you could take that management on yourself and you could be responsible for those uh, images that you provide. So you could, you could do it that way if you, somebody must have that control, but it feels like having all that control is actually an anti-pattern, right? Like, I don't want control. I want somebody else to deal with it. I think we have time for one more short question. Any more questions? All right. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, thanks. I just want to say, please follow me on these social networks. Uh, I'm on Mastodon, Linux, make Linux face. Um, and if you want to talk to me today, I will be at the AWS booth from 3 to 6. We'll talk about Bottle Rocket if you want to do that. I'll run you through a demo if you're interested. Um, I don't sell anything because it's open source. Like, use it if you want to. But thank you, folks. I appreciate it. Thanks for the comments, too.